Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Privacy Whisper live talk. Today, we are here with Max Schrems, and we are waiting two or three minutes until everyone arrives. So while we wait, please let me know where you are connecting from. And I see Max in, is it at Neub's office? Where, where is the office, Max? Uh, we're based in Vienna, and um, usually, yeah, we're working out of Vienna, but um, as as always with a lot of people from abroad, where most of our team, we have 20 people, most of the team is not from Europe, uh, from Austria, so a lot of people also work remotely, and um, yeah. At the same time, we realized after Corona, it's kind of nice to be together and, you know, brainstorm and exchange, so we have a bit of this mix. <laughs> so, so most people work remotely, or most are in the office? Um, most of are basically everybody's in the office generally, but there is then, you know, more, you know, if you're having a European de team, there needs to be more flexibility about being home and flying home and so on. Sure. And, and uh, 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 out of topic, I, I want to say congratulations to the people that write Noib's blog posts. Uh, they are so <laughs> well written and organized and they give background and even if it's a complicated <laughs> legal issue and i love that i think simplicity is important and sometimes when we read about legal judgments or legal issues it's complicated so i don't know who is in charge if, if you're if, if you're participating as well so congratulations yeah it's usually a mix of like lawyers and 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 tech people uh, and pr people trying to write it together but it's two worlds that are a bit colliding usually <laughs> like lawyers are really interested in the you know 25th sub part of the judgment and then for the general public you want to have like a you know the major takeaway um, so what we actually try to do a bit more is we also have GDPR where we do like these summaries of decisions that are like a more legal database or more academic database. And so what we do now more is that we summarize the judgments like in an academic way and then link to it to maybe have like two versions, one like what's the gist of it and then a more detailed academic one. <laughs> it's very good and it's also optimized for social. I love it. I, whenever <laughs> I see something from Noib, I go to your website to check. <laughs> Wonderful. Thanks. <laughs> I'm here with Max Schrems. He's the chairperson of NOIB. I'm going to talk a little bit about NOIB in a while. He's a privacy lawyer. And if you work in privacy, you certainly heard of him. And you'll learn, if you are in law school learning privacy, you'll also learn what, what he's been doing in the privacy field. He's also an author and speaker. And I'm so honored to have you here today, Max. I think your perspective is unique. Your work is unique. You're a trailblazer, is uh, what you do in privacy. and your attention to data subjects rights and protecting people, fundamental rights is so important. And, and I don't see anyone else doing the, the, the size of work and <laughs> leadership that you have. So I'm super honored to, and I think people are so excited. I don't know if you saw that I posted on LinkedIn and, asked, uh, and, and I, I said, I'm, I'm talking with Max and everybody, the real Max, that there were some comments that you didn't <laughs> believe. That you There's a duel around. <laughs> Yeah, you're like a mystic figure. So uh, you're seeing that you're here and people really- I usually say I'm a kind of the privacy Mickey Mouse. It's like, you know, if you go to Disneyland or whatever, there's Mickey Mouse and then in privacy land, I'm, I, I seem to be one of like the standard, you know- I, um... I would say privacy Taylor Swift, right? Like, uh, <laughs> okay. Better, no? Updated? Okay. Um, so it, I'm, I'm so happy to have you here and we, today we are going to talk about GDPR enforcement challenges and a few uh, topics connected to it. Uh, I'm Luisa Jarowski. I'm a lawyer. I'm the founder of Implement Privacy. I'm also the author of the Privacy Whisper newsletter. You can you see the, the link here. If you can sign up. And today we will talk about uh, the cases. But before we start, I want to talk a little bit about NOIB. So NOIB is the nonprofit that Max is the chairperson. And I, I, I was checking, I was reading a, a bit about Noib and I, I found in the website the whole page about the concept, right? So there is this making privacy a reality. And I love that. I think it's, uh, it's sometimes privacy is such a legal topic with, among lawyers only. And it becomes almost like a, a, talking about data and a very formalistic issue. And, and Max and Noib represents this, this effort into making it a reality and, and really enforcing rights and fighting for that. So, and, and they, they work on membership. So I, I invite everyone to check Noib's website and become a member. So that, that's how they, they work. They're a nonprofit. And before we start about the specific topics, I'd like to invite uh, Max to talk a little bit about, about Noib to present to, to someone that doesn't know what is it. Yeah, so basically under Article 80 of the GDPR, there is um, the option for seeing that NGOs enforce these rights or represent people to do so. Um, so we're basically, there's a specific article on that in the GDPR that we use mostly. 
Um, and what we do is what we call strategic litigation, or ideally it should be as strategic as possible. And the idea is to, um, you know, go to litigate, bring up litigation where there is uncertainty in the law, where there's different views on it. And we just, I think everybody in the bubble just needs clarification. Obviously, we usually then argue for the privacy friendly version of this clarification, um, but we're very, I think, um, different than like more of an activist NGO. We're not kind of, you know, overly activistic. Usually the arguments we bring are very much based on traditional case law that exists, the traditional books that exist. Um, however, in the privacy field, because oftentimes what's done is so far outside of what's legal, I, we oftentimes still seen as like, you know, very pro-privacy. But I think if you read the law properly, you oftentimes will arrive at the same results, which also means that we usually win quite well because we have a rather conservative approach to stuff. Um, and rather kind of really just want to have the law enforced as it is. That's kind of like generally the, the, the strategy. Uh, we do have a couple of cases that we call standard setting cases. So where we say, okay, there's two different views. Let's see what which one's the right one. Um, where we put much more time and effort probably into a case than at a normal law firm or so. So really like research more, you know, have more background, try to connect to others. Um, then what we also saw that there is a lot of stuff that is decided where we know what the law is. Um, but companies simply don't comply. <laughs> um, and that is what we call mere enforcement cases, where it's really just about, you know, putting, pushing to actually comply. Um, there we're automating more and more now so that we basically automatically scan websites, send a complaint to the company first, uh, try to, to kind of do a settlement with the company before we even bring it to the data protection authority, which works really well. I mean, most companies then are quickly to say, oh, sorry, <laughs> all fine, which is more efficient than going to the authorities oftentimes. Yeah, that's kind of that that whole bulk of, of work. Um, that's about 10 lawyers that work on that. And we have um, three tech people, then a bit of admin, PR, that kind of stuff. Um, that's kind of that work. What is also upcoming is kind of the collective redress directive because the EU now has to kind of like class action. Luckily, it's not an American class action, but a like very much more a nuanced system. Um, and that also allows to have enforcement for GDPR. So we're preparing for that. That's kind of roughly what we do. Um, and as you mentioned, yeah, we're mainly uh, supported by individual donations. So anybody can become a member from one euro to infinity. Obviously, infinity is preferred. Um, and, um, and then we also have some like um, foundations and so on that support us as well. So that kind of is roughly how it all works. And we're based in Vienna, but um, explicitly a European organization. So we're not doing Austrian cases primarily. Great, thank you. So if you're not a member yet, check Noib's website. They are very. Uh, they have a blog post about when, when there's a new case from Noib or new issues in privacy, they, they have a very interesting way to inform people. So check the website, become a member. And if you want to, to, uh, to learn when the next events will be and to, uh, to get to know more about the Privacy Whisperer newsletter and the live talks, please subscribe to the Privacy Whisperer, you have the link. So today we are going to cover five main topics. And uh, I will leave the one that most people asked for, for me to ask Max about transatlantic data transfer and what's going to happen. So this will be the last topic. So if you have to stay <laughs> Making the sure end. everybody stays until the end. <laughs> so this will be topic five. The, and the five main topics we're going to talk. So first, we're going to start with Meta, three different uh, cases, uh, uh, interesting ones that, uh, from 2011 until uh, 2023. Second, we're going to talk about Noib's 800 cases and the GDPR's five years, what happened, what are the problems, and enforcement problems and the proposed uh, procedural legislation. Then we'll talk a little bit about uh, AI. You know, Max, every, every talk has to mention AI at some point. So we are also talking about AI and the AI Act and what's the impact. And I will talk a little bit about my perspective of how AI is impacting uh, privacy compliance and if we if we look at comp some new AI companies, can we say that they are compliant? And maybe even some hints to Noib's new enforcement cases, maybe maybe that's your, your next uh, uh, route. Uh, a little bit about the future of privacy, if Max is optimist, not optimist, what, uh, what, what's going to happen? And then we move to transatlantic data transfers. So first, Meta. And uh, before we talk about the most recent uh, higher fines that we have, the 1.2 billion euro fine, Let's talk about that 2011 case, Max, where everything began, right? You were much younger. Uh, you know, we are, we are the same age, so I can say 2011. Long time ago, we were almost children. And you, as a very smart 
lawyer, you had a complaint to the Irish Privacy Commissioner. And, and I, I'd like to hear from you. I, I, we, everyone read in the media what happened and, and that you, you, had, you wanted to exercise your, your right of access. That at that time, there was no GDPR yet. That was a different legal landscape. But you went after it and you, you went there and asked for Facebook and then Facebook delivered to you like 1,200 pages. So how was it? And really from your personal, what was the click? How, how did you decide to, to do it and, and change forever, let's say, privacy enforcement? <laughs> I don't know if I changed it forever, but um, the so basically the trigger there was I already did privacy law before in Europe and, and I was interested as a student that was I mean also a bit still post 9-11 that decade where suddenly there's a new surveillance law here and there and and you wonder what you know what all of this should should actually mean um, and in that in that time setting there was a um, I was a student in California for half a year and there were some people from like the tech bubble in the US uh, talking at our university and uh, you know short version of what they said was you know, all the privacy discussions in Europe is nice, but um, the reality is there's no enforcement, there's no consequence, nothing anyways. And exactly at the same time, Facebook established in, in Ireland for tax avoidance reasons. So I was like, OK, so they fall under European law now. And um, actually, just to get evidence for my or footnotes, so to say, for my thesis that I would have to write there, I just made a couple of access requests. And the interesting thing is that I think at the time they were so overwhelmed with how to deal with this that they just burned random data on a CD and then shipped it to us. And one of them actually went to Australia first because apparently they got the typical Austria-Australia confusion. Um, and that was interesting because a lot of the data that was there was data that was previously deleted that they shouldn't have anymore, that was not disclosed in a privacy policy. So really very, very basic um, stuff that should have been there. Um, and that was kind of the starting point where I thought, OK, there is a regulator in Ireland. They're in charge of that. And I'll basically just write a complaint so that the regulator has the evidence and, and can go further on that. Um, not expecting the Irish regulator to do everything but enforcement. Um, and, and that basically gradually became the story because, you know, you send this complaint and you see that there is no consequence. Then you, you know, go to the next step of, of litigating it um, or pushing further and so on. And that kind of became the story. And I personally never wanted to become kind of the... the as I said, privacy, Mickey Mouse or clown or whatever of the world. Um, but, you know, you're kind of then gradually in that in that position. And, and yeah, um, and people also need faces. I think that's one problem of today's world is we all need faces for everything. Um, and then you need a privacy face. And that was a bit like what media also made out of it, especially in Europe. It was this kind of like David versus Goliath student going against big company kind of story, which was interesting because that worked in Europe really well, while in the US it was more of a, Oh, student against big company, never going to happen. Not a story that guy will lose anyways. <laughs> that was also interesting how the perception was a bit different there. So you had, but you know, to be, to do the amount of work you do today, it requires a lot of passion about that. So you, you had it before it was, the click was, you had like a, I Let's think there was a bit of a, yeah, I mean, there was a bit of a, like, not giving a fuck all too much and just see what happens um, attitude. Um, and then what really triggers me more than a privacy discussion is more of a rule of law discussion that, I mean, we do have these laws, we call it a fundamental right. And then if you violate it, nothing happens. And that's really hard for average people that care about it because they have a specific problem usually, then they care about it more. Hard to comprehend because... You know, if you park in the wrong spot, you pay 50 euros. And if you speed, you pay 70 euros or whatever. Um, and if you just, you know, abuse millions of people's data and make a shitload of profit from it, then nothing really happens. Or at least for a long time, hardly anything happened. Um, and I think that is where my passion was stronger, more of a fairness question or a rule of law question of, you know, if, 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 I don't know, I was like having my cell phone on on a bike a while ago and police officer stopped me over and I had to pay fucking 50 euros. Fair enough. You know, that's that's a law. I'm not happy in the moment, but that's just the way it is. Um, and no one would question that while in the privacy field, field there's still this view oftentimes of, yeah, you know, if you don't, it's fine and, and nothing is going to happen. And, and if there's enforcement and there's outrage of this terrible officer that could have possibly you know, ask me to not be on the phone. <laughs> and, and it's amazing because we have this really, really weird culture in that area of non-enforcement, of non-compliance, of, of kind of shrugging it off as, as it's okay anyways. 
um, which I, we all hoped for, I think, or what at least the legislator wanted to change over the GDPR. I mean, the big point with the GDPR was big fines, major enforcement, all that kind of stuff. And it's amazing because the legislated enforcement, I mean, we have more than 90% in the European Parliament voting for this. All the member states of the EU voted for this, other than Austria, because we thought it's not strict enough. <laughs> but, you know, it has very, very strong political and democratic backing. But then in reality, when you talk to even regulators, you hear, oh, that would be funny if we would actually enforce all of that. You know, it's just like, you know, if you're the drug police and you say, oh, it would be funny to actually enforce that shit, you know, then you probably have the wrong job here. And, and I think that it still will come a very long way of, of maturing in that area of really saying, OK, it's not just some right, but it is a fundamental right and there is going to be consequence. And I think the legislator thought that you can legislate that culture, that you basically just pass a big fine and, and, and that is going to happen. But now we see that the regulators are not really taking that up. They have the powers now, but they're not exercising them. And I think that's, that's an interesting situation. Again, all of that is very much simplifying a European average. There are definitely regulators that do more and less. Um, that, that's got to be important to say. Um, but we do see a certain trend that is, that is not ideal. Great. Thank you for sharing about the, the, the background of the, the whole story. And uh, another one about Meta. So let's, let's keep the, the two other cases I wanted to bring about Meta. So the other one was being, there were 10 years of litigation and is the 1.2 billion fine right, right after the anniversary of five years of GDPR. And <clears throat> sorry. Uh, it, it was, uh, and, and you, you, you spoke about it. I read it, what noise, how it was. 10 million euros in, in to, to litigate, right? Uh, and three court procedures. And the, the Irish DPC tried to, to, to back it, and it was rejected in 2022. There was a very long story in this case. And, and as a result, so Meta cannot transfer data from the EU to the US. And people sometimes from the outside, they look at it and they, it, it seems just formalistic and they don't understand what, what's the essence mm -hmm. behind what type of rights are being violated. And I think we could talk a little bit about the the, the section seven seven so five hundred seven hundred and two, yeah, uh, right. The foreign intelligence surveillance, mm -hmm. and I think that's the, the background, right? Where people yeah. sometimes they see those cases, the, the fine, and they say, "Wow, Max is just fighting for those transfers." What what what's the point of transferring, not transferring? So, uh, do you want to talk a little bit about the the, the foreign intelligence that it all started with with the Snowden revelations, and then we, we now have these transfer issues. Uh, and, and so the, as a result, data should stay in the EU, but we are going to talk about the data transfers in the end. So maybe the, 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 there's more to talk about that. Now it's going to be hard to keep that separate, but let's see. Um, <laughs> so um, generally what is interesting, I think, with all of that is for 702 and, and US surveillance and also the executive orders. So the biggest problem I see in the European debate is that everybody has a view on data transfers, but hardly anybody has actually read 702 or understood how it works. Um, mm -hmm. So it's it's very interesting that everybody has views, but but oftentimes not the relevant information. And I see that now with the new deal as well, where basically the commission goes out and say everything's fine, but then if you actually ask, you know, where is it? Where's the text? And you know, there is there is silence. Um, now, fundamentally, what 702 does is, um, let, let's start even one step earlier. The really interesting thing to me is that we agree on both sides of the Atlantic that mass surveillance, as the Americans do it, is a violation of fundamental rights or constitutional rights. Um, it violates 7 and 8. The Court of Justice has said that 20 times now, or two times, but it feels like 20. <laughs> and, um, and it violates the Fourth Amendment in the U.S. Now, the problem is that the Fourth Amendment only applies to U.S. persons. So basically, they do something that they know is unconstitutional, but because the Constitution only covers their own people, it's fine to do unconstitutional surveillance on anybody else. That is the fundamental premises of all of this. Um, and what 702 does in very simple terms is it separates the data stream into an American concerned people data stream. Totally unconstitutional to touch that part. And then you have the whole rest of the world where you can do whatever the fuck you want to do because they don't have any constitutional rights anyways. Um, and I think that is the fundamental thing of what 702 does. It is a switch that basically says, here, absolutely horror if you ever touch anything. There you can do anything that, of whatever you want. And we're basically all in that second stream. Um, and it's fundamentally a question of if you call that a human right or if you feel that every human has you know, certain rights to privacy or not. 
or if only Americans have these rights. And, and the standard right now in the US is only Americans have that right. And that is also partly the standard in other surveillance laws and other even EU member states. Um, the US oftentimes says the whole EU does the same thing. It's not true. There's just very specific member states that have similar laws. And I think what we have to discuss um, long term is if we have a globalized internet where the whole data system is just interconnected and you only have rights in one part of it, then it automatically means that we don't have rights in, in most of the internet. And I think what we basically need to overcome that is what you would call a no spy agreement or something like that, which is an agreement among um, the, the um, kind of democratic countries, at least, to say, okay, there is minimum baselines that we all agree on, which is there has to be probable cause, there has to be a judge approving it. The, you know, the typical things we've all heard a hundred times in, in national law. Um, and that is kind of, I think, where we have to go to. And one factor that adds it adds to that and gets me back to when I was originally interested in privacy is we move the whole surveillance apparatus from a counter, um, you know, counter Russian or whatever <laughs> idea of, of or, you know, countering other countries or, you know, stuff like that um, to really going after individual persons. And as bad as, a, you know, knife stabbing is, a knife stabbing is not a matter of national security. It doesn't undermine the nationhood or the stability of your country if someone stabs someone else with a knife. That is criminal law. That is fairly criminal law. And we see that there were all these protections in criminal law. And by having the, the surveillance apparatus creep into stuff that was traditionally criminal, which is, you know, psychopaths, religious, whatever, the all different reasons why someone commits a crime. Um, there is this blending now where suddenly all the things that we that we always expected from from um, especially telephone surveillance or like surveillance of, of communication um, is suddenly thrown away because we know, suddenly call it national security. An additional element of 702 that is also underestimated is a lot of it is really espionage on European countries as well. Um, there is no, you know, if you're a NATO member, then we're all friends. I mean, Austria is not a NATO member. It wouldn't help anyways. <laughs> but um, there is this narrative that, oh, we're all on the same side. We're the West and, and we're all kind of friends. But the reality is that a lot of that espionage also goes directly at the core of going after our politicians, of influencing politics. Um, and also, in addition, also for businesses. It depends on the sector that you're in, but there's certain sectors where for different um, embargoes that the U.S. has, they use that data to kind of enforce embargoes and so on. So it's it's a bit more nuanced and complicated um, to, to dive through that. Now, what the U.S. tried to add to kind of overcome the issue is so-called so executive orders. That is the second big element to understand. Um, so 702 pretty much says anything goes. That's an overstatement, but it's 13 pages. There is a lot of like minimization procedure and targeting procedures, blah, blah, blah. But if you read them properly and read all the interlinks, you realize that as a European, you just fall through all these filters. Like they're, they're not meant for you. Um, so there's a lot of like, yeah, there's a court approving it, but yeah, they approve a filter that actually doesn't apply to Europeans anyway. So why do I care if this court approves anything? Um, so once you've fallen through this whole system, in the US, we have the problem that they just are almost unable to pass new legislation because of the turmoil in, 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 in American politics. Now, what they try to do is to, they can theoretically limit what the government is using of these powers through an executive order. So an executive order is basically an internal um, directive by the president for anybody below them to say, um, you may have the power to do X, but please only do X minus two. And thereby you limit kind of what the government really does. Now, one problem with that is it doesn't have third party um, enforceability. So if that guy still does X instead of X minus two, they can just do it because it's basically them violating their boss's orders and, and that's it. Now, that is one of the problems with these executive orders. The other thing is that even the executive orders are extremely broad and permissible. Um, so they do say that there is bulk surveillance for, I think it's about 10 purposes. And the, even with the new executive order added purposes, like, for example, um, the, the bulk surveillance for combating climate change, where I don't know how that's done, but now all our data is fair game if you want to do climate change. And also for um, international um, or like for, for kind of like coronavirus type of uh, endemics. So there is even more now that you can do. And one problem with the comparison that the commission does is that there used to be an old executive order called PPD-28 that was very, very much the same as the new executive order. So now they're like, 
oh, new executive order, magic. And then you're like, yeah, but there was something before in the court of justice already said that's not good enough, so we have to compare the two. And if you do the comparison, there is there is not that much that's left. So I hope that's a bit of an overview that's useful. Um, in detail, it's very, very complicated. And and um, it took me a long while also with, with the help of American experts that, that do surveillance laws in the US much more um, to even get to the details of it. And even if you do that, one last element that, that's maybe interesting is a lot of these decisions are all secret. So we oftentimes don't even know how these words are interpreted or how that's really done in practice. And judging from the past, you see how words that were not, you know, that you felt are reasonable were interpreted in ways that were so extreme <laughs> that only 10 or 20 years later, you realize, oh, that's what they're doing in this. <laughs> so so that is that is all in combination, a, a very problematic situation and and um, kind of unfortunate. And in this specific case of Meta's transfers, they, they still cannot, can they still appeal? No, it's it's still, right? Yeah, so um, the whole case is under appeal in Ireland right now. Um, the Meta is, I think we're right now, we're running about 20 appeals against each other or something like that. Usually they then submit hundreds and thousands of pages. So to be honest, by now, it's, it's even not even possible to read all the things that they put on appeals. Um, so a lot of lawyers must sit a lot of hours and make a lot of money from just writing bullshit. Um, once you go through it, there's really very little quality to what they write. So it's just like producing paper, making it really hard for everybody, making it miserable for the judges, miserable for everybody else, miserable for the authorities. Um, and there is a, a strong tendency of just spamming everybody. Um, and and that makes it, I mean, for example, in Ireland, the Schrems 2 litigation, you mentioned that before, um, was about six weeks in hearings in, in Ireland. Just, you know, you had to fly there every weekend. You had to go there, you know, sit in the fucking court for five hours to listen to some crazy stuff. Um, and all of that, um, especially in Ireland, leads to extremely high costs. So the Schrems 2 litigation was estimated to be overall about 10 million euros. If I would have lost it, I would have had to pay the 10 million euros. Um, and that is um, a lot of these elements that are not discussed because it's like, yeah, anybody can just go to the court of justice. Look at Max. That was so easy. Um, and then you realize that national procedures are fundamentally fucked up oftentimes, um, are, are not up to, to speed. Um, there's a lot of like little tricks in national procedures that make it impossible to bring a case. And um, just extremely expensive. Um, I mean, Austria is one of the cheapest jurisdictions. There we can appeal the DPA for 30 euros. But in the average in Europe for an appeal is around 5,000, I would say. Um, so you have a free right to go to the authority. But if the authority doesn't do its job, you have to pay 5,000 euros to have the authority do its job. And then usually in administrative procedure, you don't get the money back. So it's kind of like, yeah, I got a free lollipop, but I have to pay 5,000 euros to get the free lollipop. Not really. <laughs> That's not really free. Um, so there's a lot of these dynamics that we see over the past five years where the authorities realize, oh, if I just reject everybody, everybody of 99% that I reject, there's going to be one or two Joes that actually go to the court. And then I'm just going to deal with that one case, but get rid of everybody else, for example. Um, and, and there is a lot of like, um, yeah, very problematic strategies that go around. Same thing for companies. They, for example, never give you the full access request. And once you're on appeal and you've litigated for three years, they're like, oh yeah, no, we found the data. Here it is. Let, let's stop the case. We're all done now. And it's just like, that's not like meant, the law meant that you should get that in a month and without all this trouble. Um, and everybody's happy to just close the case because the judge doesn't have to deal with it. The DPA doesn't have to deal with it. So let's close it. Let's just be done. Um, and, and the learning effect is that if you drag it out and if you don't comply from the get go, you're smarter than the competitors that do. And that is also in the business perspective, not really fair because the ones that really try to comply and do it well or do it as good as they can, um, may actually put a lot of work into something that others don't do. And, and there's still no difference or no consequence from it. And I think that is a bit of a dynamic we see at least in certain member states where where that becomes very prominent and i think at this point they're just waiting for you and noib to take care of it i don't see other is the the free lollipop i think they're waiting for max to come and, and save people are waiting yeah, for you to save them. yeah. um and but, i have to but, say one one addition like for us it's sometimes easy to do these things because we have more resources and so on but even with our resources it's very limited of what you can really do 
Um, but we always try when we bring a case to not say, hey, can, how can we fix it for an NGO that has, you know, a couple of thousand euros to, to, to bring a case. The reality is we need to fix it for an average person that just, you know, wants to have access to data. The boring, as boring as it is, but people have the right to get access to their data and we have to make sure that there's a path for them. And on this topic of competitive, uh, how uh, complying or not can be a competitive advantage or when you don't comply, mm -hmm. you're actually, actually making money. I think the next meta case is a, is a good one. So the third, <laughs> third and last, then, then we, are, we are done with, with meta, we move on. Uh, so Meta's GDPR bypass, so from 2018 yeah. to 2023, but didn't finish. Let's see what's going on. So I, I, I think it's so important and I, don't, I, I write about privacy UX and consent and how do you, do you, do you design your interface to make it easy for people to understand what's going on. And I, and I love to use Meta as an example because they don't do it well. So uh, this case, you, you, you filed it. On the day that the GDPR started being enforced, so in 25, May 25, 2018, and basically, uh, what what meta what happened is for, for those that are not familiar, so the GDPR is the General Data Protection Regulation, and it, there is an article that says that to process data, collect and process personal data, you need to have a lawful basis, and basically for companies, what's left uh, from some of the alternatives are more for for public uh, authorities, and for companies, basically there is consent contract or legitimate interest. And so Meta was relying on contracts. So they, uh, I don't know, maybe Max know when they exactly they added the sentence, but Meta, what Meta said that they were, they were uh, collecting the personal data for behavior advertising because that was the contract. But when you sign up for Facebook, you, it was part of the service that they were delivering yeah, behavior you know, advertising. Was, especially on the timing, what was really interesting and that probably um, makes it much more understandable what they did is they literally did that at the midnight when GDPR kicked in. So they said exactly the second where the GDPR applies, suddenly the consent is not on our web page and we actually have to kind of consent somehow, but we move the consent into our terms and conditions. So by basically saying, I agree to my data being processed or whatever the exact wording was, being moved from kind of like the privacy policy to the terms and conditions, now suddenly Article 61A, which is consent, doesn't apply anymore, which is all the conditions are freely given, informed, specific, all that kind of stuff. But now it's a contract and the GDPR doesn't regulate contracts, so therefore we can do whatever the fuck we want to do. Now it's it's really, you know, I was saying it's like, you know, a person saying, oh, I'm not dealing drugs, I'm just having an envelope where there's drugs in. That's just literally, you know, as much of a legal creativity as they had here. Um, to me, it's amazing that lawyers even think that this would ever get by. Um, but what motivated them to think that was that they had 10 meetings with the Irish regulator. <laughs> the, and the Irish regulator told them, that's fine. That's cool. You can do that. Um, so we really see a conspiracy, basically, or a cooperation there between the regulator, in this case, and the company. And that was really, um, to, be, to be frank, in Austria, that would be um, a criminal offense if a regulator would do what the Irish regulator has done there for abuse of office. Um, and the situation was that they had first these 10 meetings where they agreed on this bypass. Um, then we brought a case. We didn't know that they had these meetings because they're all secret and confidential. Ireland loves everything to be confidential that could possibly be criticized. Um, and once we actually brought this case, there was a lot of other shit that they did and, and tried to kind of, you know, move us out of the procedure. Um, but fundamentally what they, what they, um, tried to do then is that they, tried to issue a new guidance on the EDBB level to kind of legitimize this Irish bypass on the European level. So the DPC went to the EDBB and said, oh, let's have you know, guidelines on 61B. Not telling you why. Um, and they specifically suggested to have an, in the EDBB guidelines a suggestion that um, social media that uses data for advertisement, who else would that be other than Facebook? is legitimate and fair and all, all legal. Now, the other DPAs voted that down. The other DP, It was apparently a vote from one against everybody <laughs> and, and voted that down. Then once they, it was clear that the European guidelines would say you can't do that bypass, the DPC tried to make sure that the guidelines are not published. So they asked the EDBB to not publish the guidelines. So you see how they really try to, to fuck the system. Um, they delayed the whole case for about three and a half years. They could have decided already everything was clear, um, but they did another investigation, another paper, another, and the DPC is great to sell that as, yeah, it was a very thorough investigation. You're like, you had a draft decision, a final decision, a draft, when it, uh, 
we did a kind of um, a um, play, plagiarism checker, checker where you can check how much of the text is the same. It's like 70 or 80 percent the same text. You just pass the same text over and over again. Don't react to anything that the parties have said. Just just, you know, pretend that you're working, pretend that you're doing something. And then after four years, they still said they think that, uh, that all of that is legal, despite the Europeans telling them already it's one against everybody here on this view. Even when they voted them down in the DBB process, they again waited for half a year to have the final kind of like version of it, the final vote of it. It's, it's really how to fuck up a procedure as far as possible. And there is a lot of the DPC strategy is to remove, for example, evidence that is, um, that is useful for the complainant. So in our situation was really interesting. The evidence that we put forward were simply removed. It just didn't exist in the in the in the decision, and that is, I mean, really hardcore abuse of office um, that we haven't seen in any other authority in Europe. Like that is really exceptional. That basically, literally, they tamper with the evidence um, and um, also withhold the evidence from the other European partners. And the problem is with the system how the cooperation procedure works is that they often have have to answer within two weeks. Now, if you throw 200 pages of a decision at everybody else, but withhold all the relevant information, how are they going to figure that out in two weeks, read the whole thing into the weeks, get back to you in two weeks? So they really kind of use every button to make it impossible for the rest of Europe to say, hey, there is something fishy or that's not an accurate decision. Um, and that was the situation here overall. Um, in the end, the EDBB decided largely the right way. What happened in the way is that we actually said there's nine reasons why they process data under 61B, which is legal. And the EBP actually at some point limited only to behavioral advertisement. Now, there is no nothing in our complaint that says behavioral advertisement, nothing in the procedure talked about behavioral advertisement. Suddenly in the procedure, um, there was another <laughs> funny story in between. We then basically published a draft decision, which under Austrian law, we got from the Austrian authority. And in Austria, you can just use any public document and disclose it. There is nothing to it. And by doing that, they told us that we would have violated Irish law, which in Austria, I'm not subject to. It's not my problem. Um, but what the DPC then did is that they withheld all the documents in the future and basically told us that unless we sign a non-disclosure agreement, like a civil contract with a regulator under Irish jurisdiction and with Irish penalties and all that kind of shit on top of it, then we wouldn't get any documents in our own case anymore. So it was literally we were just removed from our own case with, with this situation. Um, I mean, a lot of that, if you read Kafka, the trial, you're like, to be honest, Ireland is crazier than anything Kafka has ever thought of. Um, so we didn't know a lot of the files. We do know that in the end, um, they came up with only behavioral advertisement. So Facebook now says, oh, we can still use your birth date, for example, because your birth date is not a behavior. And no one defines what is a behavior. For example, is your location a behavior because you go there? Or is it a fact because you're just there? <laughs> so even the decision now doesn't really clarify a lot of the edges of where this decision applies or not applies. Um, so the EDBB decision was also rather problematic. Same thing with the EDBB. They are also now of the view that they ha don't have to talk to the parties, neither the company nor the complainant, which you can already see leads to bad quality decisions because people cannot tell you, guys, there is nothing about behavioral advertisement in our complaint. So any advertisement. But by not listening to anybody, you're not going to hear it or realize it or, or deal with it. Um, so we do have that whole fight. And it ended up even with the DPC now suing the EDBB because they disagree. So it, the whole thing is a shit show for itself. I could probably go on for 10 hours to explain all the craziness that happened in that one procedure. Um, however, all of that is kind of irrelevant because now the Court of Justice has decided in the Bundeskartellam case anyways that Facebook cannot use that and also cannot use legitimate interest which again was really interesting. The Irish basically said, oh, we're only going to investigate 61B. And then Facebook, first we had 61A, then we had 61B. Now Facebook said 61F. And they basically do one legal basis after the other. And I think in the end, they will at some point declare themselves being a public authority, having the power to investigate ours for advertisement. I think they're going to use you know, 61D at some point. Um, but you see that even how the procedure is structured, instead of saying, OK, let's put all the legal basis you use on the desk, investigate them, make a decision. They are doing bit by bit by bit by bit. Um, and that leads to procedures that take forever, that never lead to a decision, that never lead to a consequence. Same thing for the data transfers. We first had um, the litigation was on, on, on Safe Harbor. 
Then once we won that, they said, oh, actually, we're not using safe harbor. We're still using standard contractual clauses. Now you go on on standard contractual clauses. Then they go on on privacy shield. You know, it's just like um, if you if you plan procedures well and as an authority know what you're doing, you tell them, okay, this is your submission. You can now put everything on the table that you rely on. And then there's going to be an end to the discussion. And, and the DPC... Either they're the craziest people to ever do procedures and are absolutely not knowing what they do, or it's a deliberate attempt to really undermine it, while at the same time pretending to be busy, pretending that you do something. Um, and that is that is overall the situation we have there. Now, for the data um, processing, it's really interesting because, first of all, this, especially the Court of Justice decision, clarifies that there is no legitimate interest for advertisement, which a lot of the industry has still claimed for crazy reasons. Um, secondly, we know that this bypass with just putting stuff in the contract is, is not is not a path. What's interesting here is that the dogmatic part was a bit left out because I personally think if, if it's a consent and the terminology is a consent, then it doesn't matter in which document it is. It's just by its nature consent and therefore the rules for consent have to apply. Now, everybody dodged that question a bit and just said, oh, you can't do that. But the real reason why you can't do it was a bit unclear. Um, but largely what that means for Facebook is that for and also Instagram and all the others is that if you don't want to do personalized advertisement and behavioral advertisement, you simply need consent and people need to have a yes or no option for that, which means you can still do advertisement that is based on context or anything else. Um, just basically for a personalized advertisement, you would need consent and opt-in consent. And I think that is that is a really interesting development here, which um, is hardly thought through. And by the way, also cheers in this to the um, German consumer rights organization that did a lot of the Bundeskartellamt case and the Bundeskartellamt itself, the German um, cartel um, or authority that actually brought this case, which is interesting because not a data protection authority, but they were actually more successful in, in some of that than, than the data protection authorities, it seems. But today, at this moment, Meta is relying on legitimate interest, right? Because we are still waiting for the final decision of the European Court, right? I yeah, saw... no, the, the final decision by the Bundeskartellamt is out. We know that now. Um, so we're we're fine. Um, what we lack is enforcement. So again, we have this decision in January in, in Ireland. Now, if Meta appeals that. Altogether in this, we actually brought cases on Meta, Insta uh, on Facebook, Instagram, and WhatsApp. And just to give you an idea, um, these three cases led to 19 different lawsuits in different member states. So right now we have nine lawsuits in Ireland for basically appeals. Then we have three law uh, six lawsuits at the general court at the European level because the DPC sues the EDBB and Meta sues the EDBB. Plus we are the seventh. We basically have a lawsuit on access to documents because we don't get any documents in any of this. Then we filed two appeals in Austria because our case wasn't decided. Like there's only one of nine counts decided. Um, one case is pending in Belgium. Um, so overall, we're now 19 cases, yeah, um, that are just from these three complaints. Um, and each case in Ireland has a couple of hundred pages of documents, probably a couple of thousand pages. Um, the best example was I counted it once the, uh, at some point, there's probably more in the end, the submissions in Ireland for the Schrems 2 litigation was 45,000 pages. No one in the world has read all of them, not no one. <laughs> um, but it's really where you see how much energy these companies produce. And for us, it's really, to a large extent, then a struggle of how do you even deal with that as an NGO with 20 people? How do you, you know, manage that? Um, and, and you see the strategy of just spamming the courts with more and more and more. Um, one example we had, like um, in Austria, a lot of the big tech companies are represented by Baker McKinsey. Um, and they just realized they just copy in the same shit over and over and over again just to produce 50, 60, 70 pages of submissions. And at some point, we just decided to have like a general response, like a form where we said, typical shit from Baker McKinsey. Here's the answers to all of that. We're not going to answer that anymore <laughs> because this is useless. Um, and it was interesting because that also shows to their clients that they charged them a lot of money for that. And in reality, they just copy, paste and spam and and and. I guess, make a lot of money with that. Um, and there's a lot of like ethical issues in how to do proper litigation, how to, you know, behave. I mean, obviously you're in different sides and you have different views, all fair. You try to do your best as a lawyer, but there's a certain limit, I think, as a legal profession where you should, you know, really think of how far do you go and, and is that still ethical or not? And we do see that that as a growing issue with, with a lot of the companies because 
the clients oftentimes want that. Like, especially the big US tech companies, they say everything's confidential. No one is allowed to know what we say, blah, 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 blah. And, and we realized that in some of the litigation that the European companies or law firms that have to represent them are actually quite ashamed of the arguments that they have to make, but their American clients just demand that from them. And, and it introduces a very aggressive unfair American approach to litigation into into the European Union that that we we find pretty problematic um, from uh, yeah ethical perspective. And after your description, I actually understand why you have a with no idea of this uh, proposal for a procedural reg legislation. And and these those meta cases when you talk when you say that the Irish that the protection authority is backing them, so it's actually the only thing they need. But if you have a, the, the local data protection authority backing your choice, yeah. that that's what you, you're you're set. You're all set. So yeah. we, we have we... the best example for that. I mean, if you look at the uh, the decision from January. Uh, the EDPP overruled the Irish DPC and said, no, you have to enforce this. And then the DPC went in the New York Times saying, I think the decision is wrong and the, and the analysis is wrong. Now, if I'm the lawyer for Meta, I just go into the Irish court and say, oh, I have a decision here from the Irish authority. And here is the New York Times telling us that they know themselves the decision is wrong. You know, and then... If the, and the DPC will do that, I guarantee you, they will just turn around and say, um, yeah, we made some arguments, but actually we don't care and just deliberately try to lose this case. I'm 100% certain they will, in a public appearance, do some shit to pretend that they tried to defend the case, but they will deliberately lose these cases. So you have a system where on the European level, we have the cooperation procedure to tell the Irish you have to do it. But then back in the national procedure in the appeal, nothing prevents them from just, you know, missing the deadline, from not submitting something, from not making the argument, from, you know, whatever you want. Um, and that is a very, very problematic situation where um, we do have, again, a European cooperation procedure. But best example, if the EDPP tells them, give us the documents and they simply don't do it, then there is no European army that invades the DPC until they like physically hand out the document. You basically send them a letter and they say, fuck off. And that is what, what in reality they do. And again, that gets you back to this very aggressive, ethically problematic conduct that um, we see more and more of like, oh, there's a law, but you know, if we just fuck the Europeans, nothing is going to happen anyways. And, and we'll just continue as it is. Um, and that is where a lot of our energy and time goes into. And we're also, let's say, in my view, more passion is generated than with some privacy issues because it's just so fundamentally unfair. Like you, no matter which side you're on in the, in the privacy debate to just say, OK, we make arguments, but the other side is not allowed to know the arguments that we made. It's just fucked up. Um, and I think anybody in the street understands that. So as we are already talking about, let's move to the procedural issues. And yeah. so you know, I published about the 800 plus cases, GDPR related cases, right? In this, those five years of GDPR. 85% uh, were not decided, and mm. for, uh, 470 complaints waited for more than uh, one year and a half to get some sort of decision. Uh, and and you, you mentioned that Meta is fine as an example, how it took so long, and, and you mentioned some crazy uh, specifics. For, so from what from this conversation, I see that the main problem is in the data protection authorities, right? So each one, and you mentioned there are tricks. Each one has different issues that might delay or might make the decision or a final result to never happen. So you mentioned that in Poland, you have to travel to Poland to take pictures of your file and authorities, they may, they do everything to not have to decide. Do you think, mm -hmm. and also this is a side comment, do you think it's because they don't want to maybe to generate some uh, companies leaving the company? Why, why, why do authorities have to- To be honest, that? on the motivation, we, we don't have any kind of concrete indication. So um, we do know that in some member states, politi politicians have deliberately told heads of the DPA that if they want to get the position, they have to shut up and not enforce it properly. Um, we do have that knowledge. Um, we do see who gets appointed. So we see that in certain DPAs that were more active, suddenly the, they were not reappointed. They got someone else that is more business friendly and explicitly politicians then say they were appointed because they're more uh, business friendly. So we do see that the general idea that um, the, a data protection authority is mainly bad for business and that's it. And and the harm that you do is usually a harm that you to a large extent do to foreigners. Like especially if you look at Ireland, um, 
there is a certain idea of let's be in the EU and let's have official European law apply, but then actually not really enforce it. And, and that is a larger problem. I mean, the European Union has a legislative power largely, but it doesn't have an executive power largely. So most of the executive enforcement is done by the member states. And if they simply don't do it, I mean, the problem is as old as the European Union. Um, you, you have you have certain issues and you don't, you, you need options to kind of go after that. And right now, the main option we have is a is is a um, is a procedure by the European Commission, so an infringement procedure. And that's by definition so hard to do and so political to come over that that that's only done in the craziest cases. So most member states get away with with not enforcing stuff. And um, again, we don't know the exact motivations. I think there is a mix usually that some are motivated, but their procedural law is so complicated that they can't do it. Um, some of them don't have the resources. Um, others do have the resources. If you look at Ireland, they have the same resources as the Spanish DPA. Uh, the Spanish put out like two or three decisions a day or even six or seven a day and the Irish put out six or seven a year. So it cannot be a matter of resources. Um, so we do see that there is a lot of that dynamic. There is also, they mainly interact with the businesses. So mainly they hear from business 24 seven, how terrible it is, how hard it is to comply and so on. So there's very little interaction with, with the individuals that are really concerned other than a complaint that oftentimes is, you know, a lot of the complaints are ludicrous and crazy. Um, so there is a certain dynamic that we have here of, of, of really not doing it all too much. Um, and another part I think is the history of it. Like a lot of the authorities didn't have the power to enforce, didn't know how to enforce, didn't have investigative powers, didn't have powers to fine and so on. And you would have probably had to put people in there that come from, you know, financial enforcement, from banking enforcement, from any other type of enforcement that have an enforcement mindset that are like, okay, if I'm not sure if you have that data or not. I guess I have to check the server because how else are you going to figure out the problem? And and we still see that authorities are, are absolutely hesitant to actually investigate factually what happens or to actually go somewhere. We even had that as a company saying, you know, um, we're just going to have a separate interface for if the com if the authority ever comes to not see the shit that we're doing. Mm. And without going to the server and the raw data, you will not see it then. I mean, that's very simple to just have a user that only sees half of it. Um, and, and there we really, in more and more procedures, we now build more capacity to dig in and find stuff out like that. We really see um, very, very deceptive behavior and very, again, ethically problematic behavior that is not uncovered because the authorities are simply not poking. And, and again, the learning effect, especially from the big data industry, the, da the industry that really makes money with data, which is a different one than 90% of the industry that just has data but doesn't really, you know, uh, try to capitalize on it. Um, but the really the hardcore data users that oftentimes know their business model as a whole is just illegal. And the only way that they can survive is just to ignore it. They learn that that it that they get away with it and that it works. And and that is um yeah concerning. And and from that, so Noiva identified 60 procedural issues and came up with 16 core concepts. And then you proposed a very interesting organized uh, procedural legislation. And and the commission also proposed something that you, you said is not enough. So do you want to talk a little bit about what? First, my first question is, do you, from all those issues, and they are very deep issues with political, uh, also a political aspect of it, do you think that only changing the procedural rules that we will have better results? Or, or do you believe in, in procedural legislation? Yeah, so um, I think as a lawyer, without procedures, nothing happens like you need to have proper procedures otherwise your best claim is going to go nowhere if your procedures are rotten and we have very rotten procedures so having a proper procedure regulation is extremely important i know it's boring as fuck and even i try to ignore procedure law at the court of justice because or at the at the, at the law school because no one likes procedures but the I reality is to say it. I, I hate the litigation and procedure and you seem to yeah. be in love with it you're you're great you speak of fluently and, and passionately yeah, yeah, like, it's amazing I, I mean i see it more as a chess game let's put it that way maybe that's a, that's a way to think about it that's interesting um now however without proper procedures this is going to go nowhere now the proposal by the european commission would probably make things worse than they are right now so the commission um, follows the kind of this French approach mixed with a um, EU um, car cartel markets kind of approach. So that's a law that they know. 
they don't know how national procedure law works. And the problem is the French are the only authority that we know of that, that simply says there is no right to complaints. So you can file a complaint, but the complaint is more of a petition or information, but we're not going to deal with it. Now, even when Neub files complaints and we won sometimes, or most, I think all the times, um, the only thing we get is that we're absolutely not heard by the French CNIL, never. And then in the end, when we won, we get a link to their website with the press release on the outcome of our procedure. <laughs> that is our procedural engagement in, in, in France. Now, the CNIL is definitely wants to do the right thing, move stuff forward. So the outcome makes sense. But from a procedural perspective, as an individual, you're simply out. Um, now, most other member states grant you procedural rights, give you access to the files, hear you, and so on. Now, the commission tries to do the French model as the standard in Europe now. So they basically try to give us less rights as a procedural party than before. And interestingly, also for the controllers to a certain extent, they limit the time that you interact with the authority to very to one or two times, which in very complex cases is ludicrous. It's not going to work that way. So for example, in the 61A, 61B we discussed before, we said, oh, we think that 61A, so therefore blah, 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 blah. Then they said, no, no, we're relying on 61B. Then we're like, okay, if you're relying on 61B, then that that is the reason why it's illegal so and then they were like okay and what about sensitive data yeah then nine <laughs> and, and then there was cookies and so on so in this in this in the course of the procedure um you have to react to the counter argument of the other side it's like otherwise as a complainant you're always going to lose because you have one shot and then the other person can just you know move to the side and say oh you missed me now and then you move you know to the other side the next time and you miss and if you, if you can't say oh that's not that move isn't legitimate you're not going to win your case. Um, so we have a very problematic situation there from the proposal of the commission. And in addition, what adds to it is that they also want to remove the powers from the co uh, concerned authorities. So it's, right now, the idea was we have this lead authority, usually the Irish, but then the other authorities can you know, overview what they're doing and check on all of that. And it's really, again, about individual little wording. So for example, the commission proposal says that the other should get a summary of the facts. It doesn't say neutral. It doesn't say all the facts. It says a summary of the facts. So what are the Irish going to do is they give you half of the facts that go into one direction and all the other facts they're not going to share with anybody. Now, they also say the EDB can only base its decision on facts that were previously established by the lead authority. Now, if the Irish simply deliberately don't establish the facts that go into one direction, they cannot ever decide in any direction anymore. So on either there is a very, very strong view in the commission to just fuck these procedures and not have that anymore. Or they simply don't understand how procedures work. And there is indications that this, the letter is, is the reality. Um, we we have a very, the, the system is going to get worse with this new regulation than, than, than the current situation. Now, this goes into the European Parliament and into member states. And it's very unclear if it's going to go through because the member states don't want the EU to legislate procedure. Le procedure was so far always a matter of the member states. And having this very bold move to just say, it's only this EU procedure, all your national procedural law will go away, is, is, is a huge interference with national procedural law. Especially there's no clear rules of conflict of law situations, how this interacts. Um, the EU law is too thin to actually allow a procedure to proceed. So, for example, what are language, you know, rules per country? What are, when, how is evidence gathered? How is a, a witness called in? When can a witness decline um, anything? So all of that is not regulated. Um, so it's it's going to be very problematic on that side. And the uh, parliament will probably not going to be overly happy that consumers and, and users are totally kicked out of the procedure. Um, so... If you read it, you almost have the feeling the commission tried to get a failure out of this or tried to not get this through. Um, because if you would, you know, draft something that would probably get shitloads of criticism from anybody, that's probably what you would have drafted. Um, and that is a bit yeah, worrying because we were very much a fan of a new regulation to properly define that and properly go through with it. Um, what we have on the table right now is is really something where I'd rather say, okay, fuck it, let's just stay with the system as it is. That's very fucked up, but less fucked up than that proposal. <laughs> I see, but but it's good to see that someone is taking care of procedure because it's it's boring. It's very boring, I think. 
but uh, yeah. I, I saw some people here, Peter saying that he loves litigation, but <laughs> let's move a little bit to, to hype, to AI. Oh, I'm kidding, no, no hype. So uh, I'm, I'm very curious to see your perspective because it, it, we're, we're talking about, we spoke a lot about meta and behavioral advertising. Those were the, the, tradition, the, the typical issue with social media, a lot of surveillance and behavioral advertising and transfers. And now I think we have something of, of new here and maybe I, I really want to hear your opinion. So the AI act is coming and we are now, uh, since last year, every every media channel talks about AI and there is chat GPT and new AI based systems and all those uh, uh, chats that, that talk with us and, and they use, they, they are trained based on scraped data from the internet. And I'm curious for, uh, to hear your perspective. So if we think about data subjects, right, let's say right of access or, or as you started, right, 2011 or, or rectification, basic, basic thing, or right to be forgotten, I cannot go to, open AI and say, please delete my data, please, there is. And I made some tests, for example, I give my LinkedIn profile, I say, hey, this is Louisa, look at her LinkedIn profile. And it comes back with a, oh, you want to learn more about Louisa? And then it says a text that is nothing about me, it's something else. But it says, this is the Louisa of the link. And, and what if I'm a, I'm a citizen and, and I'm an European citizen and I want to say, no, I have the GDPR right of access, the open AI, please give to me all the data you have from me and, and rectify or delete or, forgot so basic principles or even a lawfulness right so let's start with the scraping uh, scraping from the internet to train and then use it it's not clear if it's still personal not personal after it's used for training so how do you see compliance of these new ai based models that have you is no involved is no give us a, a hint yeah. So I have to, like, there's a lot of questions. I'm probably not, I'm, I, I like to answer stuff if I'm qualified to answer it. On AI, I'm not qualified to answer on a lot of the details. Um, we usually bring litigation on stuff that in reality exists and in reality concerns people. Um, and so far, we hear a lot of, like, blah, blah on AI. But in reality, most of the decision processes, for example, are very, very simple calculations of one plus one plus three, <laughs> and then you basically have an outcome. So we, in, in our daily practice, where we get you know complaints by people or find look at our stuff ourselves, AI has simply not played a major role yet. It will okay. come at some point. Yeah, um, so probably, we very yeah, I'm also so asking because you probably saw the Italian data protection regulation yeah. and the Germany, they ask for more information. So yeah. I think things are coming. What, yeah. yeah, absolutely. And that's also why we have probably not done that much because we already saw the regulators to poke around and to do something. So, you know, what what would we have added to the discussion really that that is, that is useful? Um, two observations on all of that. So first of all, obviously it's interesting with the whole training data, how that went down, um, how much that can be done as research. Um, that, that is an exemption from the GDPR, an option to get out, um, and, and how much there is jurisdiction, a lot of that. So that, that's one really interesting part. And how much of that training data is then actually encapsulated in, in the AI, how much that is basically still personal data, because if you synthesize it so that there is not really a personal link, which then leads to crazy answers on your profile, <laughs> then maybe there is an argument that that's not even personal data in certain situations. Now, all of that, really not an expert, there is a lot of people that probably know very well if that's true or not and can answer that question. The second part that I find more interesting right now is the question of accuracy. Now, the GDPR, I always explain it that way, is a raw data law. It basically says, can you process data? Can you not process data? But how you process it is not really regulated by the GDPR. I mean, with tiny examples, but generally it's a raw data law. However, it says that, for example, the result of the processing has to be accurate. Now, anybody that has ever played with OpenAI a little bit, realizes it's very good in pretending, but there is actually very little. I mean, we put judgments through it to say, OK, can it summarize a judgment? It literally says you the opposite of what the judgment says. Mm -hmm. um, so there is going to be a huge problem once you apply that to personal data that you will generate shitloads of wrong information. Yeah, and that lawyer be... that was accused of sexual harassment, that, 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 that typical case of uh, personal yeah, data. Yeah, and that would be really interesting for the person running that because we now know that there is emotional damages under the GDPR fully, as the Court of Justice said. If you are accused of sexual harassment by some crazy software, whoever runs that software is the controller of it, will definitely have a couple of cases up their ass. <laughs> and, um, and that is going to be really interesting, this whole accuracy part that I think 
this technology is interesting for a lot of like jittery stuff where it doesn't have to be perfect. You know, I don't know, pre-sorting emails or something like that, where, okay, if it went to the wrong department that one person can send it forward, nothing happened. Um, but if it's really used for, you know, making decisions about individual people, be it credits, be it, you know, hiring or whatever, we're really in a territory where, at least right now, maybe that's different in, in two or three years, the quality is so bad that you got to have a huge issue with, with accuracy principles, um, independent of all the other stuff. So that's, I think, from... because. That's usually where people also get upset the most is if 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 they are accused of something that is not correct or if they if, if there is inaccurate data about them because people often say oh you know if it's not accurate it's nice because then they don't have the real data I was like hmm, usually inaccurate data is even more problematic for you than than the real data um, and that could be that is I think where I see the most tension that's coming up I mean right to access and so on is interesting as well but probably more of a geeky thing. Uh, for the average Joe, it's going to be really interesting if that just produces wrong information about you to, to have litigation there. Absolutely. And now we are talking about transatlantic data transfers. So the big question Ooh. is, when is Shrems 3 coming? So th this is a few people asking. So I'm, I'm kidding. We don't need to ask like this. Um, I just so, had a call today for our prep because we already have like a lawsuit in the drawer. We just basically now need to wait for um, companies to sign up to the new deal. And then we need a person where actually their personal data was transferred under the new deal. Um, that's all the elements you need. And then you can basically file a lawsuit. Um, there is different options to do that. Um, as I mentioned, in Ireland, there's right now litigation on the way. Could be that there's something coming out of that. Um, there may be stuff all over Europe where someone, you know, brings it up. I mean, it doesn't have to be a Schrems 3. I'm more happy if, if it's, I'm happy enough if it's a Smith 3 or a Joe 3 or whatever. Um, and yeah, and then there's the option that you do a civil case where you basically just have an injunction against an individual company to not process your data anymore, which would mean that any local judge either has to reject the case, which most lower instances will probably do. Um, and then at some point, they have to refer to the court of justice, and that would be a path to get it back to the court of justice rather quickly, um, which is what we're working on. So um, right now, we're just really trying to keep this time of uncertainty as short as possible. <laughs> um, one thing that I find really interesting is the Court of Justice usually takes one and a half years itself. Um, now, it could be a bit quicker because now they have a certain routine with all of these questions. Um, but the Court of Justice also has an option to, to make a commission decision not applicable for the time being and basically pause the applicability of, of that decision. And that could be interesting if the Court of Justice says, okay, we're dealing with the same shit the third time from a again rule of law perspective we maybe have to kind of stop this because otherwise we're in this endless ping pong where the commission is just quicker in passing something than we're in in, in invalidating it and to cut into that one option would be to um just make it not applicable for the time being um pending the outcome that that could be an interesting move the likeliness that that happens is 10 20 percent it would be a very big move for the court of justice to do that um but it would be a very interesting thing to to ask for or, or see if we can get it done and some people asked uh, and i think you already answered so what would make max happy they they asked with this language and, uh, and i don't like this language it look it yeah. sounds like the the commissioner right the commissioner mm. that, that puts you personally but the whole thing is the, the surveillance, right? I mean, so what should change for us to, to stop and say, now we ha we can have data so transfer? First of all, it's absolutely irrelevant what, what makes me happy. I'm not the relevant person here. What, what's relevant is what is, is going to make the court of justice happy. Um, that's the person deciding, not me. I know that everybody needs a face for that and, and so on. But the reality is I can only bring up stuff. And if my arguments are stupid, then they will be rejected. If they make sense, then the court of justice will follow them. Um, hopefully, <laughs> and, um, but uh, that um, I think is the first part. The second part is we really need a shift towards like this, what I mentioned before, like a no spy agreement, some kind of agreement among democratic countries to say, okay, we accept. And to frame it differently, what the US is asking for is to say, we're gonna be the cloud provider of the whole world, give us all your data, but once it's here, you have no rights. And that's, I always compare it to Switzerland saying, give us all your gold, but once your gold is in Switzerland, foreigners don't have property rights. So you have no rights to your gold anymore. And no one would ever, you know, put gold into a Swiss bank vault anymore, <laughs> if that's the reality. But we're all still putting like our data into an American vault that really has a huge backdoor. Um, and I think that is the fundamental understanding that we have to move to. 
we have to get the American businesses to, to kind of really care because so far they felt, okay, my European customers are not running away. I don't get big fines, so whatever. So once we have that dynamic, it would be interesting to get the Americans to say, okay, we do have a problem for our industry. We're never going to convince them on privacy and privacy rights for foreigners. That's I've lived in the U.S. I love the U.S., but culturally, that's not going to happen. <laughs> that politically, that's not going to happen. But what could happen is to say, oh, we have problems with with you know selling our products abroad. Um, and that could be a path forward to say, okay, let's agree on certain standards on both sides of the Atlantic. And one element that's really interesting in the new executive order is that for the first time, the U.S. demands that reciprocity. They do say you only get the rights under the new executive order if you guarantee that the European Union also gives us rights in the U.S. And that is a very interesting move because if we go into the system, we will basically automatically move up to a certain level because if both sides say, okay, there is only going to be data transfers if you value my people's privacy just like I value yours, then we're basically moving towards this kind of um, no spy situation. Again, to be realistic, we're going to probably at best have that among democratic countries. We will, I think, see a splintering of the internet because Russia is gonna is already kind of having its own thing. China has its big firewall. We, that's just a political reality. And I think that's also really important for people in the area to, to, to get their head around. We grew up in a situation where the internet was simply not regulated. So anybody just did whatever the fuck they wanted to do. Now, the last 10 years, we see that everybody's regulating the internet like crazy, especially the European Union, but also especially um, countries that have authoritarian regimes to make sure that that's not used for to overthrow the government. So we see now an expansion of, of regulation, but what we don't have so far is a conflict of laws rule. We don't have a, if you are a company in country X, only the, the laws of that country apply to you. We don't have any agreements like we have for airplanes or whatever, where we say, okay, whoever is the owner has to take care of the security or whatever. Um, so we do have a situation where you're going to have major conflict of law situations where as a company, you're simply subject to the to multiple jurisdictions and they simply have different views. And as long as we have democracies and different cultures, we will have different views on that. Um, to give an example, that's not privacy. In Austria, denying the Holocaust is a criminal offense. Now, culturally, we'll never abandon that law. You have you can have wonderful arguments if that's really necessary or, you know, if that's freedom of speech and how much it limits it. But the reality is we're not going to get away from that. Um, now, the U.S. will never get away to say denying the Holocaust is freedom of speech. Like on the American view, you can deny the Holocaust as much as you want to. Now, as a company, you have to manage these two situations somehow. And neither of these, comp these, these countries are go is going to go back on that. Same thing on copyright issues, on open source, on whatever it is, AI, all the laws that the EU is right now passing with, with Digital Services Act, all that stuff. And that is going to be a reality. I think with the privacy discussion on data transfers, we are a bit ahead of, of the problem. It's a very early situation where this comes up, but we'll see the same problem in so many other areas and we'll have to come up with some system for that. Again, at least among the democratic countries. And I think that is um, a discussion for the next 10 or 20 years to have. And I'm happy to probably be the first, you know, caller in the, in the wilderness. But just politically, economically, we will have to get to that because there's hardly a way that, that we can solve these problems otherwise. We can't solve it by individual decision making in, in each country. It sounds difficult and uh, non-achievable, but... I hope. We so let's move to, to the last point. So are you optimistic uh, regarding the future of privacy? So how, how if we are think we are 2023, so we, for until 2033, you think enforcement will be better company. We will have other forces making companies mm. comply more. I don't know co privacy has a competitive advantage or social norms. Yeah. Do you see some? What, what's your, your, your take? I think there. Uh, so I'm, I'm absolutely pessimistic when I look forward. But then if I look three weeks back or two years back, then I suddenly become optimistic. It was like, oh, my God, it was even worse then. And that's just, you know, I'm probably that's my Eastern European part in my genes is that I'm very pessimistic on everything. But then you're like, oh, it's less pessimistic if you look at that. <laughs> so that may be the version of optimism that I have there. Anyways, um, the interesting part, I think there is um, that if you look back, we definitely see a move. We see that people do not accept certain things anymore, that people get you know, frustrated. Um, there is a lot of these 
social cost or a reputational cost of doing privacy wrong that probably will become more and more a thing, like more and more companies will realize if I have a shitty privacy banner and that's the first thing that companies uh, that customers see, they will perceive me as a shitty company before I talk about the wonderful CO2 emission reduction that I did. <laughs> and, um, so there, there will be elements of that. There will be definitely more enforcement, I think, especially with the Collective Redress Directive. That is another big opening on, on, on that. We now see the first big penalties took way longer than it should have taken, but we see that it moves towards that. Um, we still need to wait that anybody pays them, actually, because it's one thing to announce a penalty, another one to actually collect it. Um, but we see that dynamic. So, And then I think the field is probably going to professionalize more as well. So we do have a lot of people, and um, we currently have job openings, and we had more than 100 people applying for the last job with us. And we see that still there's a lot of quality issue with people in the area that just, you know, did a quick course and still got, you know, are just doing their privacy thing and, and get away with it. We will fundamentally have to mature and, and fundamentally have to understand that this is not easy. That is not done. You can't just do that. Um, and I think that is going to be probably the next five or 10 years as well, a bit of a differentiation of like who really understands this thing, knows how to navigate it, and also gets into a positive vibe in the sense of like, how can I do an inline privacy decision where users say, okay, I have two options. You present it as a company, why you think the one and the other one has a benefit or a downside, but you leave it to the customer to decide. And that is, you know, where it becomes less confrontational maybe in an ideal world, but more of a built-in system. I mean, if you look a bit of like, you know, what Apple tries to do to say, oh, you have two buttons and you can click one or the other and you're in control is a very different narrative or way of dealing with that than saying, oh, you have to consent here, otherwise you can fuck off. Uh, you know, that 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 way of dealing with customers may change as well. And then obviously the whole enforcement part is really interesting where, to be honest, I see tendencies in different directions from like, yeah, let's finally get it done and finally move to still absolute denial of saying everything is fine, everything is good, and we're not going to do that. And, you know, we haven't done anything for five years and I didn't get fired, so why should I start working now? That's extremely all over the place, depending on the authority and then we're in Europe. Um, so that's going to be really interesting how the regulators are going to act on that. I, I think from a personal perspective, I think the GDPR, besides the, the typical legal changes that it brought, it brought a kind of a privacy culture and also privacy professional, this whole thing and, and talking about, and you see privacy news every day and more people want to, to read about privacy. And, 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 and you said, and you mentioned Apple. I think there's a, a lot of small forces that they are coming together in a certain way. I, I, I agree with you. I see people more expecting more and, and kind of judging a company also do, regarding their privacy practices. So uh, I, I'm, I'm not in love with procedure. I, I, I yeah. trust your effort, Max. I think you're going to do the, the best uh, efforts regarding procedural um, change. One, one thing to add there, maybe, um, I oftentimes compare it to something like workers' rights or, or women's rights or whatever we had. None of that was like one in a day. Like, you know, there was finally, okay, I don't know, voting rights for women. But now, 100 years later, there's still income disparity. You know? <laughs> then we have, like, workers' rights for 150 years. But still today, we're fighting about, you know, how many hours, how, how is the compensation, how... So none of that is ever won. I think that's also an important thing to, to realize, that especially fundamental rights are fought for every day. Again, freedom of speech was never won. You know, we're still having discussions if asylum is a real thing. <laughs> and so um, these these things are, are never won in our dynamic situation. And, and I think we all have to accept probably that it's going to take probably all of our work life or our whole generation until we see that something moves further. And if you then look back, you realize how far you've come along. So I think there is there is a certain there was an overestimation how the GPR would just in one day change the landscape. But at least you received 100 emails uh, with no a notice that there was an update in the privacy policy. <laughs> exactly. And you didn't get any email or you deleted and you found, wow, we are, we, we are starting a new age. So it sounds very optimistic, end of session. And I, I want, I think we are all past our time. So I just, do you want to say a last, last statement, last message to say something? The, the I just want to say thank you for the nice conversation and I hope it was useful for people. <laughs> I'm sure it was. Thank you so much, Max. I'm so happy that we had this conversation. I think we managed to go into very detailed aspects and you, you managed to, to show that you're a real person. You're not a <laughs> mystic, Max. 
And thank you everyone for joining. If you want to get informed about the next events, please sign up to uh, subscribe to the Privacy Whisper and see you in the next event. Bye bye, everyone. Bye there.